National Society for Biblical Hermeneutics. And I am here with the archaeologist, Dr. Titus Kennedy. Titus is an adjunct professor of biblical archaeology at Biola University and a research fellow at Discovery Institute. He is also the author of this new book, Excavating the Evidence for Jesus, the Archaeology and History of Christ and the Apostles and, and the Gospels. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so you're a, uh, a sure. career biblical archaeologist. Uh, what is it that got you into this field? And what prompted you to write a book on the archaeology surrounding Jesus? I always liked history, even when I was a kid. And I got introduced to archaeology in fourth grade, reading about the excavation of Troy. And that was my knowledge uh, that we didn't just take old historical texts and keep copying those, that there are actually people who went to cities to dig up the past, so to speak. And I, I found that even more interesting than just learning about history. But then as I got older, especially in high school, I started reading more about archeology span connected to the Bible. And I came to understand that there were hundreds and hundreds of discoveries of archeology span that related to the Bible, both in helping us understand the text of scripture better and also demonstrating the historical accuracy. And that eventually I decided I wanted to try to study that. And so I went on undergrad, master's, doctorate, worked on a bunch of different excavations and finally made that into a Okay. Uh, so what is it that got you to write specifically about the uh, archaeology surrounding Jesus? Well, because Jesus is the center of the entire Bible and of Christianity, and he's really the most famous person in the world, you can do an analysis of internet searches, or you could look at books that are written and newspaper articles that are written in documentaries and you see how popular Jesus is or how interested people are about Jesus mm -hmm. who are not even Christians and I thought if I'm going to write books about biblical archaeology we definitely need one that is centered around the archaeology of Jesus and the gospels and we had a, a plan with my publisher about you know which books to to do and we decided actually to move up the one on the archaeology of Jesus earlier because we all agreed that this is a really important topic that so many people are interested in, especially today. And there was a need for some updated resources on the archaeology of Jesus because a lot of new discoveries have been made, a different perspective than a lot of scholars are giving on the historicity of Jesus and the reliability of the Gospels. I think that was a, a great decision on y'all's part. <laughs> Jesus is certainly the most uh, important figure in, in, in all of history, uh, not just biblical history, right? So, right, right. Uh, what, what did you find to be the most important or most interesting artifact in all of your research relating to the life of Christ? That's a really hard one to <laughs> single out, but I'd say one of my favorite artifacts is the Nazareth inscription. Okay. It, is, it is really interesting to me. I wouldn't say that it's the most important artifact about Jesus. It, it actually doesn't mention Jesus, but it seems to allude to the resurrection story and particularly the one that the Roman soldiers were spreading about Jesus. But because of that, it is such an intriguing artifact that the emperor would issue this proclamation about a new law, a new penalty for people who broke into these stone carved sepulcher sealed tombs that uh, allegedly, you know, stole a body with some ulterior motives behind it. So it sounds so much like the Romans are trying to suppress the story of the resurrection and make it sound like the disciples stole the body or uh, you know, maybe additionally or either or they are trying to make sure nothing like that ever happened. 
happens again because by this point, you know, it's only several years after the resurrection, Christianity has spread so far throughout the Roman Empire and it's creating a problem and they don't want more problems like that. Okay. So it's a uh, it's an inscription forbidding people from uh well, what exactly is the content of the, the the inscription? The content is that there's a new penalty, death, for anybody who breaks into one of these rock carved tombs that is sealed with a big stone steals the body out of that tomb with wicked intent is what it says okay was that so sort of the, uh, very, the accusation very against jesus yeah it gets very very specific it's not just don't desecrate burials it's not uh don't loot items out of tombs it just focuses on one type of tomb huh. which was not a roman type of tomb and stealing a body with some kind of ulterior motive and People didn't go around stealing corpses from graves. That was not an issue. They would loot items within burials sometimes, uh, you know, if it was something valuable, but there wasn't a problem of getting rotting corpses. Okay. Now, you, you mentioned this inscription, but it, it doesn't mention uh, Jesus by name. Uh, we have a lot of New Testament sources about Jesus. Obviously, he's written about in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. We have several uh, ancient historians and philosophers and theologians that talk about Jesus. But do we have any first century inscriptions that might refer to him? We do. So one has been very controversial, and that is the James Ossuary. But after about a decade of undergoing analysis by many different scholars in this legal trial. Most scholars have come out to the position that it seems like it's a legitimate artifact. And what is it? The, so it's a bone box that allegedly would have belonged to James, the brother of Jesus. So it's a bone box with an Aramaic inscription that says, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And that's why when this sort of hit the public specter, they thought immediately, does this have something to do with Jesus Christ because of this name relationship? And it's from Jerusalem prior to 70 AD. Well, James was martyred in about 62 in Jerusalem. And he was the leader of the Jerusalem church. And of course, he was the son of Joseph. And he's, all, he's called the brother of Jesus Christ also in Josephus. So people knew about that relationship. It's not just from the Gospels. And the really odd thing about the inscription is that in all of the ossuary inscriptions that have been discovered, there's only one other one that mentions the brother, and it doesn't mention the father. So usually they would mention the father or the profession or the place that the person is from. But they've specifically done this relationship of names and added the brother onto it. And so initially, the scholars who were making allegations that this was a forgery, uh, they they had to acknowledge eventually that the first part of the inscription was original. But they were then saying, oh, this brother of Jesus part must have been added later. But then the patina was investigated. So this the, the ancient layer of residue, and it was the same over the whole inscription section so then we could say no brother of jesus was inscribed at the same time as the rest of the inscription in the first century so it wasn't added later so it, it really seems to be this inscription that of course it's for james but it's also mentioning jesus which means it would be a first century inscription mentioning jesus in jerusalem before 70 and that would be our first inscription you know archaeologically from the time of Jesus specifically, not from a you know, next century, attesting to him there. So that, that would be huge. But even more recently, in the harbor of Alexandria, they discovered a cup, a dedicatory cup, that was probably used in some type of magic rituals. And the cup's from around 50 AD, middle of the first century. And inscribed on it, it says that it's dedicated to Christ the 
magician. And Egypt, uh, in, in, a, in a sort of a magical context, thought of Jesus Christ because they thought of him as a magician in terms of the miracles that he would perform and casting out demons. They looked at him in their context of magic. And so they thought that his name had power and uh, that invoking him would have power. And so they made this cup and probably lots of other items like it. Uh, we have some, some magical papyri from Egypt from a bit later. And in one of the formulas for casting out demons, it says that one of the Jesus God of the Hebrews. So they, they knew about these events and then they would just use him like the seven sons of Sceva and Acts did. That's interesting. So you've mentioned this uh, Egyptian cup for uh, magic purposes, which would be in conflict with Christianity. Uh, you've mentioned the uh, earlier inscription, which would have been done likely by the enemies of Christianity, trying to prevent something like that from happening again. Uh, elsewhere in the book, you mentioned the Alexamenos Graffito, which depicts uh, Jesus being crucified, but they have his, his head depicted as a donkey. Uh, you mentioned that there might be a reference to the, the triumphal entry there. A lot of this stuff, it sounds really antagonistic against Christianity. How can mm -hmm. stuff like that, that's trying to fight against Christianity, actually be used to uh, contribute positively to the defense of the Bible? Well, first of all, it shows us that of Jesus and of Christianity outside of what might have been a fairly small group of actually believing Christians and followers of Jesus Christ. So the story is out there. The information is out there about Jesus. They know a lot of different things about his life, at least basics of it. So it's not like he was just invented in the second or third century or something like that, which you know, some people have tried to posit those ideas and then the specifics you know like, like with the alexamos graffito they the crucifixion of jesus but you say they depict jesus in a negative light well that tells us they're not christians this is not this cannot be passed off as christian propaganda so in a way they actually give a more legitimacy to the historical reliability of the gospels by acknowledging these events they don't they don't like jesus or they don't agree with him or they have a different perspective on him but they're still saying he exists he was born in judea in a village he was crucified under pontius pilate and that alexamenos graffito is actually the earliest artistic depiction of, of the crucifixion that has yet been discovered and it, it turns up in Rome on the Palatine Hill on a wall in a building there. And it's somewhere between about 100 and 200 AD. So it's quite early and yet it's all the way over there in Rome and, and people know about it enough to be making this mockery of Christianity. So it, it speaks to the historicity of the events. It also speaks to the awareness that people have all over the Roman Empire very early on. There's a certain irony to that, isn't there? That uh, someone decided he was going to yeah, mock absolutely. a Christian, it, and now it's the earliest depiction that we have of, of the crucifixion. His intention was absolutely turned upside down, and now his uh, little blasphemous work is now uh, contributing to that which he was trying to fight. <laughs> that makes me giggle. <laughs> yeah, it is great irony. So do we have any uh, archaeological evidence for the, the trial of Jesus, including the people involved and the locations and all of the, uh, the, the, yeah, the nuanced Jesus and complicated my, narrative there? Sorry? That's one of my favorite segments of the Gospels to look at archaeologically okay. because of the vast amount of evidence that we have. So we have attestation of all of the characters involved in the trial of Jesus. And we have some sort of, you know, fringe characters, if you want to call them that, where it seems we also have attestation of them. We know the locations of these things. We know, you know, we know that they existed, first of all, but 
we can pinpoint the locations of most of the events, at least, maybe all of them. And we really have such a high level of archaeological corroboration for this, for this trial of someone who was a peasant carpenter teacher with a few followers from the fringes of the Roman Empire. You know, we, we really shouldn't expect that from a social economic context view who Jesus was in terms of Roman hierarchy. And yet we can look at Annas, the high priest, okay? Josephus talks about him. His tomb has been discovered in Jerusalem. It's the most elaborate tomb of the period there. Uh, the, the house of the high priest. This is the one where it's, you know, maybe we have the location, maybe we don't, but there is a great example of a high priestly house in Jerusalem that was destroyed in 70 AD. Sometimes it's called the Kathros house because the Kathros family, there's an inscription of them and they were a high priestly family. Uh, so it may have been like the high priest's residence, like the presidential residence or the prime minister's residence, or maybe they were in a different house, but this at least gives us a good example. Caiaphas, in Josephus, Joseph, son of Caiaphas, that was his full name, and that he's the high priest. His family tomb is, was discovered. His personal ossuary was discovered with an Aramaic inscription saying Joseph, son of Caiaphas on it. Incredibly elaborate ossuary. His granddaughter's ossuary was discovered, which tells us that he was of the priestly line of Maaziah from Beit Imri, which is mentioned in Chronicles. So they actually did have... Uh, priestly ancestors, unlike during the husband. And then we look at Pilate, and Pilate is talked about in Josephus and in Philo. And, you know, he's, we know quite a bit about Pilate from outside of the New Testament, actually. And then we have an inscription that he wrote in Latin or told someone to write from Caesarea, the dedication of some kind of uh, temple or building for Emperor Tiberius. And it gives his name and title, Pontius Pilatus, Prefect of Judea. And a ring that was used at least by administrators has his name in Greek, Pilato. We know where the Praetorium was. I think we can identify Gabbatha, the stone pavement, which John talks about, the Bema. And that, you know, that was the former palace of Herod the Great on the west side of Jerusalem that the Romans then took and used as their praetorium there. So some of that's been excavated and we can we can look at it and see these specific architectural features. Um, the place of the meeting of that was on the south side of the Temple Mount, the Hall of Hewn Stones, starting in 30 AD. And, and we can see at least the, the general location and probably some of the column capitals are still in existence today and like the rest of the buildings have been totally destroyed but some of the fragments we can see that and uh simon of cyrene i think we have an ossuary inscription mentioning him it's of his son alexander and you know that's not known to too well but he, of course he's the guy that was enlisted to carry the cross of jesus so he just is mentioned in there briefly but it seems like we have a, an inscription that was talking about him too and and then peter of course is involved in this he denies jesus three times and uh, we talk about the rooster crowing which i think was the trumpet on the edge of the temple mount and there's this the the trumpeting the place of trumpeting inscription that was found but peter there are uh, we've got his house, I think, in Capernaum, his tomb in Rome under the Vatican with an inscription saying Peter on it, and the bones of this 60 to 70 year old man that's got the feet missing. If he was up, if he was crucified upside down, like the early sources say, it would make sense. And then finally, we've got Jesus and this inscription on the James ossuary, and. Christ uh, on the cup that we talked about too. So, and of course, Jesus is mentioned in several first and second century sources outside of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So we've got all these people and these places that we can look at archaeologically and it's a amount 
of corroboration historically and archaeologically for the trial of Jesus, which again, we should not expect to have that much material to be able to reference. That's a lot. <laughs> now, I have an, a, a, uh, I had an interesting conversation with a friend several years ago. He's from a uh, Hindu background. I don't know if this was something that contributed to his, his way of thinking or not, but he told me that he would have difficulty accepting Christ because he said that we didn't have any artifacts, anything that belonged to Jesus Christ while he was here on earth. Uh, no cups or spoons or anything that he used. What would be a, an appropriate response to that? Shouldn't the most important figure of history have left behind something physical that we can still touch today? Well, he might have, but we, we might not necessarily be able to identify those things. But again, this comes back to the social status of Jesus at the time of his life and ministry. He's just some peasant carpenter from a tiny village in Galilee. He's not an emperor. He's not a general. He's not a governor. He's not a high priest. He's not a city treasurer. He's not a merchant, even none of these things. So he's not going to be leaving behind. They weren't making statues of him or official inscriptions. So we can't have that kind of expectation. But I'm not not sure what it would help if we had some cups that Jesus used or, or some of the tools that he used when he was a carpenter or a construction worker. That doesn't really attest to his existence or the things that are talked about in the Gospels. I mean, that's unless he inscribed on the on the wood handle of his hammer, Jesus of Nazareth. So I think it's much more important that we have these sources from other people saying Jesus existed. Here's what he did. Here are the places. We have the places that he went. We may not have items that he himself used, but we've got places where he walked, like the Capernaum synagogue, the house of Peter, Nazareth, you know, remains of first century Nazareth, and maybe the cave where he was born in Bethlehem. The, the tomb of Jesus is there. So we do have these things that he touched, these places where he walked, uh, the trial, all the trial areas, things like that. Okay. Now, now you mentioned that the, uh, the trial can be very accurately traced, archaeologically speaking. What about the, uh, the actual tomb where Jesus was laid? Has that been identified clearly? Are there different candidates for what that could be? Is it a big controversy? Is it something to stumble in disbelief over? What's going on with that topic? As far as archaeologists are concerned, and there's really no controversy, sort of popular opinion. A lot of people might think that the garden tomb is a candidate or a better candidate, or maybe they even suggest something else. And of course, that was there was that documentary about the Talpiot tomb, supposedly being the Jesus family tomb with his wife and his, their children and all this kind of stuff. But really, the, the tomb in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the only one that scholars take seriously. And it has a very, very strong argument for that being the actual tomb of Jesus. I mean, we can be almost certain that it is. And it's for a variety of reasons. So first of all, we ancient historical attestation and tradition that is important. We don't have a tradition for any other place being the tomb of Jesus. So that is something that people need to understand and realize that that, that is key. There, there were no competing sites in ancient times. There really weren't until about the 19th century. So then you look at that. And the Romans thought that it was the tomb of Jesus, too, because Hadrian built a double temple to Jupiter and Venus over the top of it in his campaign to try to either erase the historical memory 
of Jesus or to try to syncretize Christianity into Roman religion. And so then they, they remove that in the fourth century, dismantle that temple, and they build the edicule around the tomb and then the church after that. And so we look at the tomb itself. And what is it? We, we know a lot of things about this tomb. It is a rock cut tomb. So it was carved out of the limestone. It was in an area that used to be a quarry, but in the first century BC, it had been turned into a garden. There are other tombs right around there. So it was used as a graveyard in the time of Jesus. It was outside the walls in the time of Jesus. So after the reign of Herod Agrippa I, 41 to 44, he built another wall extending out north. So it wasn't until later that, that the tomb of Jesus area was inside the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, the type of tomb is really important. So it's, it's a arcosolium stone sealed tomb like is described in the gospels. There's a burial bench there carved out of the rock. But even, even more importantly or more unique about it is that it's a single chamber tomb chamber tombs of that type in the Jerusalem area from the Roman period because they were always used as family tombs. So they were multiple chambers. They would have multiple burials in them. They would put people's remains in ossuaries on shelves in other rooms. But the tomb of Jesus was not extended and it was never reused. So it just remained this single chamber tomb. And that is incredibly important there, uh, showing its, its uniqueness and also that people regarded it as such so they didn't reuse it you look at the garden tomb for example it's it has two chambers first of all uh, it has a different type of ceiling stone that would have been used and it was carved out in the 8th century maybe 7th century bc and then it was reused in the byzantine period okay so it that's a di totally different kind of scenario that we have there versus the the tomb of jesus and the holy sepulcher and, you know, of course, we have ancient writings, Jesus going back to Eusebius, who lived in the third and fourth century. So it's, there's more than just archaeological attestation or, or agreement, I should say. We also have the testimony of early Christians knowing that this is the spot. And again, I'll stress Hadrian, the Romans knew too where it was, and that's why he built this huge temple there. Okay, so we've uh, discussed the uh, the trial and the tomb. What about the cross? Do we know where the crucifixion was actually held? So that one is a little more up in the air. Okay. And one reason is that it's just a hill, right? That they use for all sorts of crucifixions. It's not a tomb that was carved out of the rock that is going to stay there intact. So we, there is a hill, there is a rock hill that fits the general description very close to the tomb that could have been the crucifixion site. And now it's enclosed in part of the church. So it also has a very early tradition, but it's just more difficult to say that for sure. Cause maybe there's another hill nearby you know, we just don't, we don't know. So we can only kind of give a hypothesis on that. And it's just not as, as strong or definitive. Okay. We have uh, this term Golgotha, the place of the, the skull. Do we have any idea what that's from? It, it, yeah, it seems to just be a reference to death uh, okay. in terms of they used it for crucifixions. It could also uh, be uh, geographically designated, you know, maybe it was dual use, because we do see in the Gospels that they say that the hill was shaped like the like a cranium, okay, so the top of a skull is what they're talking about, so it was a rounded hill, they don't say that it's like a face, and that, that was an issue with Gordon's Calvary, as it's sometimes called, is that he was thinking of things really allegorically, actually, And then he's North Jerusalem, which now there's a bus station there, but he saw this rock face and he looked at it and he kind of said, ah, oh, I see 
like a face there. I see the eye sockets maybe in the mouth and it's like that, sound, that looks like the face of a skull. And so I think that's where Golgotha is. And it was really close to the garden tomb. And so he made that connection. Um, you know, we found out since then that that was actually probably quarried out in the Ottoman period, but even more so. It's not how the, you know, it should be this rounded hill. It's not the face. Okay. Now, uh, one of the most famous uh, controversial items surrounding this whole thing is the, the Shroud of Turin, which you mentioned in a page or two in your, in your book. Can you give us a summary of what's happening with that? Well, there are lots and lots of people very interested in this relic or artifact and doing research on it and wanting to do more testing on it. Uh, what I think that they have shown is that the, the weave and the type of fabric is consistent with what we found as far as burial shrouds in Roman period Judea. So there are a couple other examples comparing those to them. Looking, looking at them through the microscope, it's the same kind of cloth and weave. They did pollen sample tests. It's also consistent with the region of ancient Judea. Uh, so it's not consistent with something that was created in Western Europe or Central Europe in the Middle Ages. The, the radiocarbon tests have been the main issue, right? When those were done, it looked like, oh, this was actually made in the medieval period but the problem with those tests and this has been pointed out many times is that they they may have taken the sample from a piece of the repaired cloth or shroud so it was damaged in a fire and then they actually added new material onto it in the middle ages to to fix that and it the samples may have come from this later material and as I said, other types of analyses show that it is a Roman period Judean burial shroud. Um, so I would say it's at least a good example of that. You can explain still how in ancient times or even in medieval times, they could have made this image on the cloth like that of this, this buried, uh, man who looks like he's been crucified so they still have no explanation for that uh, as far as scientifically how would you produce that so it's it's very very interesting i don't think that we have sufficient evidence to say this is the burial shroud of jesus but i don't think that we have sufficient evidence to say that it's not and we certainly do have ancient sources that talk about the preservation of the shroud and it moved its way around geographically to different cities in antiquity. And so there was something that they had a long time ago that they at least thought was the burial shroud of Jesus. And this could be that same item, the burial shroud of Jesus. I don't know, but I can't say that it wasn't. Okay. Very, uh, very interesting. Now, uh, there are a lot of evangelical scholars these days who are beginning to compromise on the doctrine of inerrancy. Uh, they're saying that certain events that are written in the gospel accounts never actually happened. Uh, some are appealing to a genre. They're saying that it's a Greco-Roman biography that adds historical matter uh, that didn't actually occur historically. Does archaeology have anything to contribute to the question of whether or not we can uh, take the, uh, the gospel accounts for what they say or whether the authors were adding stuff as they went along? Yeah, I think archaeology can contribute to that discussion, in some cases answer certain questions or allegations. One of the main sections of the gospel narratives that is criticized by scholars is the census in Luke. And yet I think that archeologically we can demonstrate actually that, that what Luke's saying is correct. 
we have evidence for that occurring prior to the death of Herod the Great, rather than later on and being some localized census that was actually one that was ordered as an empire-wide census by Augustus, because it appears in the autobiography of, of Augustus himself. And he talks about three empire-wide censuses that he ordered. One of them he ordered starting in 8 BC. Herod died in March of 4 BC. You know, so we're kind of uh, looking at something earlier right and maybe it took about a year for the order to get over to Judea and for Joseph to finally act on it go down to Bethlehem and get to Bethlehem so you know I, my my opinion is Jesus was probably born in 7 BC but you know that's not like the most important thing ever exactly which year of his birth but it, it does connect well to that order uh, we also have a burial inscription of one of the officers who was under the legate Corinius was this high-ranking Roman. He was a general at the time. Later on, he served as a governor, but he was in Syria province administering a census that had been ordered by Augustus. We know that much from this burial inscription, and we know a lot of other things about Corinius too, but in Roman protocol, the military was over the censuses. They were handling it, not the civil governor. There was a different civil governor in Syria at that time, Saturninus. So he wasn't the one handling it, the one handling it as the military leader. And we also know from Roman papyri in Egypt that people had to go back to their homes to register for the census, to you know, write their information and give it to the, the Roman soldiers. So all of that stuff is consistent with what we see archaeologically. There's, there's not a historical problem there. We don't have to say that Luke got that wrong or Matthew got that wrong or something and that, it, you know, the Gospels are 80% right, 90% right, but, you know, there's several errors in there that, that we can point out, but it's okay because it was some kind of combined myth that we can choose which parts are reliable and which aren't. Yeah, so I, archaeology can contribute in that way. Of course, we don't have archaeological corroboration for every single thing in the Gospels, but we do have a surprisingly large amount, and more continues to be discovered, and we just keep seeing that the Gospels are historically accurate. We don't have all these problems. We don't have all these big chunks where we're saying, oh, that must have been a myth because the archaeological evidence contradicts the Gospels. No, sometimes we have absence of it, but that's okay. We may find it, we may not. We're never going to have 100% corroboration for any historical text from antiquity. Okay, very interesting. I especially like it whenever uh, archaeology confirms the, the smallest little details that are easy to brush through whenever you're reading the text but it's still testified now in the uh in the appendix of your book uh, you have a couple of appendices but one of them has a list of the earliest gospel manuscripts that are still surviving today uh several of these texts are fragmentary uh, some of them even contain just a few lines can we still trust the bible can we trust the preservation of the Bible if the oldest copies that we still have today uh, don't contain the entire book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my main purpose in putting those earliest texts was to show people that the Gospels were in existence and circulation, especially wide circulation, even in the second century. They weren't, they weren't written down later on in the second century or in the third century or the fourth century, even as some people have, have thought or claimed. Uh, as far as the preservation of scripture goes, we're, we're looking at all of our texts, right? And we go back to say, what, what is our earliest date that we can assign to a complete gospel manuscript, for example? And that would probably be the fourth century but then we can compare that to later texts still from antiquity. And we see that we have the same 
Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Luke, the same words continue on. So we start copying tradition. And so when we go back and say, compare like a 10th century manuscript to a second century manuscript, where we can compare them, we see, all right, it's matching up. It's got the same content. And since we have evidence of accurate copying over the centuries, we can infer that they also accurately copied, you know, those sections that are missing from the earliest fragments. And, you know, we may find more, I'm, I'm sure we will find more fragments in the the future. I don't know if we're going to find every word of the Gospel of Matthew, a, a copy from the second century or something, but it just, it demonstrates the, the early composition, the early circulation, and then the, with all of those, the text, it shows the consistent, accurate copying, and, and that would be the preservation. Okay, very interesting. Uh, thank you so much for your work here. This has been very, uh, interesting i would encourage everyone who's watching this to get a copy of the book how do we go about acquiring one probably the easiest way is to just order it on amazon if you've got an amazon account but you can also get it directly from the publisher harvest house uh, it's, it's also available at a lot of other online outlets and probably in some some bookstores at least uh, I don't know exactly all the brick and mortar bookstores that are carrying it, but certainly easy to get online from a all variety right. of sources. Uh, I have the paper version. Is there a Kindle version as well? There is, yes. So there's a version and there's also an audiobook. although I would definitely recommend getting either the paperback or the ebook so that you can see all the pictures. Great. Uh, what kind of research are you working on now? Is there another book uh, in the works? I am working on another book on archaeological sites from all the different Bible lands. Okay. So we're, we're talking about not just the Holy Land, but we're going over and looking at places in Greece and Egypt and Turkey, uh, Iraq, Iran, Armenia, Rome, etc. So trying to cover all the major archaeological sites, ancient cities, some geographic sites that come to play in the biblical narrative. So people have a you know, broader view and they've got a resource that they can use to consult for these other regions because most of our archaeological site type of books or, or tour, tour guide type of books are very heavy on just the Holy Land region and, and not so much on the other areas where a lot of things happen biblically. Great. I'm looking forward to that. Um, how can we follow your ministry? Uh, you can probably follow my uh, books, really, articles. I uh, did a TV show called Bible Unearthed on what to do, uh, some future media projects like that. And then look out for other podcasts, videos, uh, lectures. Alrighty, will do. Uh, thank you so much. Again, this has been Dr. Titus Kennedy, author of Excavating the Evidence for Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.